major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Tonight, there's a new push to stop cross-border pollution. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. There have been many attempts to solve the long-standing problem of polluted water flowing from Tijuana into San Diego. So far, those efforts seem to have accomplished very little. KPBS's Matthew Bowler tells us a local state senator thinks he's got part of the solution. The still water reflects the chirping birds, giving the impression this place is as nature made it. But then zoom out and see. This water is polluted. For decades, activists have tried to clean up the Tijuana River's watershed as its flow from Tijuana into San Diego is contaminated with both human and industrial waste. California State Senator Steve Padilla says now is the time for the state of California to do something. This is nothing short of an environmental and public health crisis, and it has been made worse by the fact that California companies are part of the problem. For Padilla, part of the solution is the California Water Quality and Public Health Protection Act, or SB 1178. Our bill would require California corporations and companies licensed to do business and sell product in California that have more than 2,500 employees to publicly disclose their wastewater discharges that can result in contamination to California watersheds. Then, those companies would be required to either clean up the mess themselves or pay a fee for the state to do it for them. Imperial Beach Mayor Paloma Gary says this is how the multinational corporations polluting her city will be held responsible. This is the way that we hold them accountable and that we are able to create a fund, a resource, so that we can begin to mitigate all of these impacts. In the meantime, pollution still flows north. Matthew Bowler, KPBS News. The planned shutdown of Mexican pump station PB1 has been pushed back to tomorrow. The pump station was set to be closed for 10 days starting today. Meantime, South Bay beaches from the border to the Coronado shoreline are closed. The International Boundary and Water Commission says the shutdown is necessary to finish construction on the International Water Collector. It's expected to carry up to 60 million gallons of untreated sewage to the wastewater plant. Looking ahead, I'm not going to rule out some drizzle later on tonight with a low of 56. And those clouds are going to keep building, especially those low-level clouds. So heads up, you could run into some tricky travel late tonight into early tomorrow. We are tracking the winds. That's going to be the big story. We'll tell you how gusty we're going to get as we head throughout this week. Students at Kearney High School are cheering for the latest round of improvements to modernize their campus. The Kearney Comets cheer squad led this morning's groundbreaking for a new two-story building which will have nine classrooms and a dining area. It's part of a larger plan which includes renovating the softball field, creating outdoor learning spaces, and adding fencing and gates for a more secure main entrance. The projects are funded by voter-approved bond money. Construction is expected to be completed in 2026. Some passenger trains are finally moving through San Clemente once again after being stopped since a landslide in late January. Well, KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer says repairs are underway and a plan to prevent future rail closures is in the works. The Mariposa Trail Bridge landslide in San Clemente had fully halted passenger train service between San Diego and Orange County since January 24th. But a few Amtrak Pacific Surfliner passenger trains have started running through the area once again. We had doubled the ridership on our first train in the morning than we were seeing with the bus bridges in place. Construction has been underway on a barrier wall at the site of the landslide for the past few weeks. Losan Marketing and Communications Manager Pooja Thomas-Patel 
explains the current limited schedule for Pacific Surfliner. So we have started two trains in the morning and two trains in the evening. We are still paused during the midday to allow them to complete construction of the wall. In addition to the partial resumption of Amtrak Pacific Surfliner, late night BNSF freight trains restarted service through the area. But Metrolink still has not restarted any of their trains through San Clemente. Scott Johnson of Metrolink says that's due to limited space during construction. Typically on a weekday, there's 14 Metrolink trains that come through that area. Four on our Inland Empire Orange County line and then an additional 10 on the Orange County line in addition to a, a full complement of Pacific Surfliner trains. This is one of many track issues in San Clemente that have stopped train service in recent years. The tracks belong to OCTA, the Orange County Transit Authority. That agency is now proposing a $200 million solution to prevent future rail closures in sensitive areas around the beachside city. It's a real critical priority for us right now because we have the landslides happening, but we also then have the coastal erosion. So we're getting hit on both sides. Orange County Supervisor Katrina Foley is on the OCTA board. She says the emergency repair proposal also needs to factor in the problem of sand retention. Trying to find solutions that will protect uh, the track from debris falling and closing the trains, but also keep the beaches uh, as a buffer. Foley says in the long term, the tracks will likely need to move away from the coast. Metrolink and Losan expect full passenger service between San Diego and Orange County to resume in early April, barring any project issues. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. When a recruit enters boot camp, the Marine Corps controls virtually all aspects of their life, including for many where they bank. A KPBS investigation found the Marine Corps systematically enrolls thousands of new recruits each year into Oceanside-based Front Wave Credit Union. KPBS's Scott Rod reports the credit union reaps millions when young Marines run out of money. I'm hanging out at Dorothy's military shop in downtown Oceanside, and the place is bustling. Young Marines from nearby Camp Pendleton cycle through the shop, buying military gear and picking up their dry cleaned uniforms. Among them is 22 year old Jesse Leonard. I've been in the Marine Corps for four years. Leonard is a regular at Dorothy's. In fact, he bought a new pair of pants here just the other day. He needed to look crisp and clean ahead of an important meeting. I had to go to the school the promotion board just to um, see if I'm recommended for promotion. The good news? Leonard was recommended for sergeant. The bad news? The pants cost him way more than expected. The purchase overdrew his front wave credit union checking account, resulting in a $20 overdraft fee. By the time Leonard realized what had happened, his checking account was negative nearly $200. He understands his finances are ultimately his responsibility. But he would have preferred if Frontwave simply denied the purchases. I got into the Marine Corps right after high school. I did not have a lot of life skills that I was taught. So budgeting has been a new thing. So I'm trying to be better financially. If I would have known that I was overdrafting my account, I would have switched over to my other card that had the money in it, you know. But for Frontwave, these fees are built into their business. The credit union has more than 120,000 members, and the majority are Marines and their family members. A KPBS investigation found Frontwave has an exclusive agreement with the Marine Corps that funnels recruits into the credit union when they go through boot camp in San Diego. Frontwave then handles their direct deposits during training. And when a young Marine runs out of money, Frontwave profits. The credit union collected nearly $8 million in overdraft fees in 2022, according to the most recent data gathered by the state. That represented 12% of the company's overall revenue that year, which is significantly higher compared to other credit unions in California. Now, Frontwave defends its overdraft policy. Meanwhile, the Marine Corps declined multiple interview requests, but in an email, a spokesperson said recruits can use an existing bank account when they enter boot camp. But that's not what we heard from the Marines we talked to. They kind of sit you in a room at MCRD and uh they make you fill out all this paperwork and they don't really tell you what it's for. Andrew, another Marine I met outside of Dorothy's military shop, asked that KPBS only use his first name. He says he wasn't able to use his existing bank account for direct deposits when he went through boot camp in San Diego. After a week or so, you get your front wave card and they're like, this is the account you're going to use. 
they kind of force you into that account. Roughly 21,000 recruits come through boot camp in San Diego every year. The Marine Corps couldn't provide data on exactly how many are enrolled in Front Wave. But KPBS spoke to three former Front Wave employees who said the systematic sign-up of Marine recruits was essential for the credit union. Without the recruits coming in, I don't know how well the credit union could survive. This former Front Wave employee agreed to sit down with KPBS, but requested we conceal her identity due to fear of professional consequences for speaking out. She says Front Wave relies on overdraft fees as a revenue stream. So a lot of times the younger Marines would spend money and not realize how many fees they could rack up. They'd be three or four hundred dollars in the hole, but we needed the money that, that was brought in by their overdraft fees. Our investigation found Front Wave has collected more than 33 million dollars in overdraft fees since 2017. The former employee said she started working at Front Wave because she wanted to help members of the Marines. But over time, she saw the credit union stray from that mission. But I, I don't think they're doing a great service for the military anymore. Front Wave CEO Bill Burney acknowledges that overdraft fees are an important source of income to the company. But he bristles at any suggestion that Front Wave is taking advantage of Marines. I'm a retired Marine Sergeant Major. I love Marines. Uh, there's no way that we would ever get involved in being predatory when it comes to those people that dedicate their lives to serving our country. Bernie notes that the Marines enrolled in Front Wave are typically younger and lower income. However, he says the credit union provides them financial counseling during their training. Moreover, he argues the company's overdraft program is a benefit. It allows them to buy essentials if they run out of money before their next payday. But we call it a service. We don't call it a fee. It's not a junk fee. Some people, many people actually, are using this as a bridge. And I think we're providing the service that, that provides, that gives them what they need to get through their, to get through the month. Yet some experts who study personal finance in the military say front waves overdraft practices may fit a troubling historical pattern. Military service members have long been targeted by payday lenders and unfair banking practices. A lot of these folks are um, young. This may be their first checking account. They may not really understand how these things work. Susan Weinstock is the CEO of the Consumer Federation of America. She previously studied the negative impacts of overdraft fees on members of the military and found the penalties weigh heavily on the most vulnerable soldiers. Uh, we want to see service members treated well. They're putting their lives online for our country. Um, so the idea that we would take advantage of them is, is, is just painful. Scott Rod, KPBS News. I'm Jeff Bennett. Tonight on the News Hour, Amna Navaz reports from Mexico's border with Guatemala and meets migrants and a smuggler helping move them to the U.S. That's at 7 after Evening Edition on KPBS. President Biden and former President Trump kicked off a rematch of their 2020 contest with competing rallies in Georgia over the weekend. Voters there go to the polls tomorrow for their primary, and both candidates will be looking for signs of what's to come. Julie Benbrook has the latest. Dueling rallies in Georgia over the weekend as President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump compete for support in this key battleground state. During Trump's speech in Rome, Georgia, the former president took aim at Biden's State of the Union address, calling it partisan and angry. We all heard Crooked Joe's angry, dark, hate-filled rant of a State of the Union address. Wasn't it? Didn't it bring us together? Just about 60 miles away from Trump's speech, Biden spoke in Atlanta and slammed Trump for, quote, who he keeps company with, pointing to U.S. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was at Trump's rally, and right-wing Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who Trump met with on Friday. But we all know Donald Trump sees a different America, an American story of resentment, revenge, and retribution. That's not me, that's not you. The race for the U.S. Senate will not come through Georgia like it did in 2020 when Biden won by roughly 12,000 votes, leaving it up to the Biden campaign to mobilize voters without the help of key down-ballot candidates. The road to the White House goes through Georgia, and uh, I can't wait uh, to continue to make the case 
uh, alongside Joe Biden in the months ahead. Biden's Georgia stop helped kick off his campaign's new I'm on board tour, where Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris have plans to travel to every battleground state in the coming weeks. Reporting in Washington, I'm Julia Benbrook. Weight management drugs like Ozempic have been the source of fascination and controversy since hitting the market in recent years, notably among some celebrities using the medications to slim down fast. But one drug maker issued a stark warning during last night's Oscar ceremony. Michael Yoshida explains. We're used to commercials getting a lot of the attention during events like the Super Bowl, but during last night's Oscars, it was a new ad campaign from drug maker Eli Lilly that's getting attention now as it attempts to put the spotlight on a troubling trend. As Hollywood's biggest stars hit the red carpet for the Oscars, pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly rolling out a new ad aimed against the vanity use of weight loss drugs. Some people have been using medicine, never meant for them for the smaller dress or tux. The advertisement not specifically mentioning Lilly's drugs or its competitors, which are approved by the FDA for diabetes and chronic weight management. People whose health is affected by obesity are the reason we work on these medications. It matters who gets them. But recently, getting the drugs to the right people has been tough. I have seen dire shortages of medications with my patients. This has been a major, major challenge. Patients flying to different states to get these medications. Another issue, according to Dr. Fatima Cody-Stanford, is that these drugs, which mimic hormones to reduce appetite and affect how our body produces insulin, were only intended for a very specific use by a very specific set of patients, those with type 2 diabetes or obesity. We have no science to back the use of these medications outside of the context of those clinical conditions. There are zero studies published in any medical journal, both here in the U.S., around the world, that look at vanity use of these medications. Eli Lilly, CEO, hoping the message is clear. These medicines were invented for people with a serious health condition. They're not invented, you know, just to have someone who's uh, famous look a little bit better. And Eli Lilly not saying how many people may be using its drugs inappropriately, but with the growing demand and that continued shortage and supply issue just highlights the point of why the company is hoping that people will only use its drugs for the intended medical purpose. In Washington, I'm Michael Yoshida. PBS is among those who collaborated on this year's Academy Award winner for Best Documentary Feature. The Oscar was awarded to the crew that produced 20 Days in Mariupol. PBS Frontline and the Associated Press worked together on the film. It follows journalists in Ukraine who were trapped in the city of Mariupol while covering the Russian invasion. This is the first, this is the first Oscar in the Ukrainian history. And I'm honored. I'm honored. And 20 Days in Mariupol is available for streaming. Look for it at PBS.org and on the PBS app. The last few years have been tough for home buyers with high interest rates, low inventory, and rising prices. But the National Association of Realtors says there is reason for buyers to be more optimistic going into the spring. Jen Sullivan explains. It's not just the flowers in bloom this spring, the housing market is blooming too. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home, many experts say this is the best time of year. We always see more buyers as well as more sellers come onto the market. Lawrence Yoon with the National Association of Realtors says many families want to close before the new school year starts in the fall, which is why this is a popular time to buy or sell. So what can buyers expect this spring? We are seeing an uh, improvement in the consumer confidence about home buying process. Yoon says buyers can be more optimistic for a few reasons. First, more inventory, which means less competition. In the past two years, we have had a historically low inventory. Secondly, mortgage rates have slightly dipped recently. According to Freddie Mac, last week, a 30-year fixed mortgage rate averaged 6.88%. At the end of February, it was 6.94%. While rates are slowly coming down, they're still higher than this time last year. Home prices, though, 
are still high. We had a substantial price increase in the past three years, about 30, 40 percent price gain in many parts of the country. In January, the median existing home sale price was $379,100, according to the National Association of Realtors. That's 5.1 percent higher than January of last year. And it's the seventh month in a row that prices have gone up. For Consumer Watch, I'm Jen Sullivan. The National Association of Realtors says buyers should get pre approved for a mortgage before looking for a home and be flexible on the closing date. Well, I want to start us off with your weather headlines, what you need to know as we head throughout this week. Now, the big story is going to be those winds. Now, for Tuesday into Wednesday, we are still expecting some gusty mountain and desert winds. But by Thursday, that wind direction is going to change to a north-northeasterly flow, bringing those winds to a more Santa Ana weather pattern by Thursday. Though we are going to gradually warm, especially later on this week. Again, for tonight, we could see a few light showers drizzle there along the coast with some low clouds, but it's not going to be a washout here by any means. Dropping down to lows in the 50s from Oceanside to San Diego, Ramona dropping down to 46, Brago Springs 49, and well, Mount Laguna 39. As we head into tomorrow, we'll see some sunshine here. We don't really have, again, too much to worry about when it comes to precipitation, but again, those winds are going to be howling, especially there across the more mountainous terrain up through the desert. So heads up, it is going to be quite blustery three at times and then by Thursday again we do have a Santa Ana wind event here on tap as that wind direction changes from the north northeast localized wind damage is still going to be a threat especially here along the more mountainous terrain dangerous crosswinds for motorists with gusts between 50 to 70 miles per hour now I told you we're going to warm up as we head into the later half of the week not by much but here along the coast and areas further inland you'll notice a slight difference when it comes to the mercury Tuesday you're at 66 again low clouds are going to start to break. Clouds and sun on tap for Wednesday, 68, and then we're back up to the 70s there by Thursday. It's going to be quite nice again heading into the weekend there along the coast when it comes to our temperatures. Meanwhile, further inland, you're also going to see a slight boost when it comes to our temperatures back up to the 70s there by the later half of the week. And again, remember, we are talking about some gusty conditions, especially Tuesday, even Wednesday, and then by Thursday, even a, fan, a few Santa Ana winds pushing in. 35, we're actually going to be cooling the further east you go, down to 35 on Friday with a few showers around, and it's going to be still a little chilly by Saturday, and I'm not going to rule out a shower to start the weekend there as well. As for the deserts, you're also going to see a slight cool down. I mean, we're warming through Wednesday, 78 for the high, and then we're back down to 69 by Thursday, cool with some Sun. Again, yes, news. I'm meteorologist Bree Guy. Disneyland wants to expand its footprint in Anaheim. The company is proposing to buy several streets from the city as part of a major new development. A new theme park and hotel would be included. The Anaheim City Council is planning to vote on the project next month. The Clippers are coming back to San Diego, their minor league team. That is, KPBS North County reporter Alexander Wynn was there for the announcement and has the story on where the basketball team will be playing. It's been 40 years since the Clippers played in San Diego, and now they're back. The Clippers NBA G League team will be relocating next season to America's finest city, rebranding as the San Diego Clippers. At least they're G League, the NBA's minor league. Currently, the Clippers G League team plays in Ontario in San Bernardino County. Come next season, they'll be here in San Diego. This is a historic day in San Diego sports history as we welcome the San Diego Clippers to their new home in Oceanside, California. They'll be playing in Front Wave Arena, Oceanside's new multi-purpose arena. It has the capacity for 7,500 fans and is set to open in September. The Clippers played in San Diego from 1978 to 1994 before moving to Los Angeles. Gillian Zucker is Halo Sports CEO, the new umbrella brand encompassing the Clippers and the G League team. The Clippers' roots in San Diego run deep. Of course, they extend down the I-5 to the sports arena, across 8 to Montezuma Mesa, where Kawhi Leonard became a household name with the Aztecs, and down to Lincoln, a historic football power that gave us a shooting star. That shooting star is, of course, Norman Powell, the Clippers' shooting guard from Lincoln High School. He started his NBA career in the G League. 
Knowing uh, the journey uh, of my whole career and uh, how hard I had to work um, to get here um, is definitely amazing uh, to be first in line uh, and be thought about uh, to represent uh, San Diego as the face of uh, basketball right now. Look at really like the top players in the league. So many of them have spent time in the G League. And the idea that this is such an attractive market, the weather could not be better. The Clippers development team founded in 2017 was first called Aqua Caliente Clippers. After the team's presenting sponsor, the Aqua Caliente Band of the Cahuilla Indians. They changed the name to the Ontario Clippers in 2022. Last season, the Ontario Clippers won the NBA G League Winter Showcase Cup. Now, they'll finish up their season in Ontario, but next season, they'll be playing here at the Fun Wave Arena, their home in Oceanside. I'm Alexander Nguyen, KPPS News. And here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. President Biden is pushing for the return of a pandemic-era child tax credit in his new budget plan. NPR's Morning Edition is discussing the proposal's chances of making it through Congress. And San Diego Mayor Todd Gloria is sitting down with KPBS Midday Edition to answer questions submitted by our audience. And you can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Triple C. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating, and air restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following... by viewers like you. Thank you.